Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, webinar on citizenship stripping in an era of racism, populism, and xenophobia. Uh, we are at 106 participants now. Over 230 have registered for this, which is wonderful. Uh, and we are delighted to be able to come to you and connect with you virtually uh, as we are in these extraordinary times with, with COVID-19 and the challenges that we face as a global community. In fact, I, I would like to actually start this uh, webinar by reflecting on some of the parallels that I see between the theme of our webinar today and, and the global challenges that we, we face with, uh, with COVID-19. My name is Amal Dichikera and I'm the co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. Uh, two reflections in particular which I think are quite pertinent. Uh, the first is that, I mean, with, with an issue, a pandemic of this nature, which is a global issue, uh, we have seen fantastic examples of generosity, of uh, coordination, of collaboration between individuals, communities, and indeed at the interstate level. But we've also seen horrible examples of this pandemic being used as an ex as an excuse to to crack down on rights, to target migrants, to target minorities, uh, to close borders, and to refuse asylum. And I think there is certainly a parallel to be drawn here with the statelessness issue as well. If we look at the, the issue of the right to nationality and statelessness globally, this too is something which can only be effectively addressed if we come together as a global community and there's great coordination, goodwill, and that this is based on international law and the rule of law. However, uh, we also have seen that the reason that many people and many communities continue to live in statelessness in the world today is because of examples of state and executive overreach, of discrimination, and of targeting of migrants and minorities. And so again, we have this challenge that we face of needing to rise above uh, partisan and communal politics and xenophobia in order to, to address statelessness. Uh, globally, we've seen great examples of coming together, the, the statelessness conventions themselves, which are drafted by the international community, fantastic regional examples, UNHCR's I Belong campaign, but we also see what's happening with the Rohingya community in India, with Assam, in the Dominican Republic, and many other contexts where we see statelessness being caused as a result of discriminatory practices. And this brings me to my second reflection, which is that COVID-19 actually does not discriminate. It affects all of us. And if we, in our policy responses to COVID-19, if we do discriminate, we end up disproportionately impacting the vulnerable, but undermining everyone. And the same is absolutely true of statelessness. Human rights apply to all equally. But if we start discriminating in how we apply human rights, and if we treat migrants and minorities differently, they are disproportionately impacted, but ultimately the human rights of all suffer. And the issue of nationality certainly brings this issue to the forefront. So with those two reflections, I would like to uh, tell you, move on to telling you a little bit about why ISI and our partners have decided that it's so important for us to be working on the issue of citizenship deprivation uh, and to be launching with this webinar actually a year of action against citizenship stripping. Uh, we are indebted to our partners, the Open Society Justice Initiative and to our other partners such as the ASSE Institute and ASHES and many other civil society partners from around the world who come together in this journey with us, which started certainly when the Institute was set up uh, five years ago. We have been increasingly concerned that the right to nationality and the institution of nationality and citizenship has been subject to steady erosion. Uh, the excuse has been different things. It has been national security, it has been terrorism, it has been migration, it has been the othering of minorities, but the outcome has been a steady uh, deterioration of the very institution of citizenship. <clears throat> and it is in response to this that we decided that this needs to be one of our priority areas and that it's an issue that's bigger than any one organization and we need to come together collectively in order to address this issue. Hence, we dedicated our World Stateless Report. This report, which is launched today, uh, it's available on our website uh, and many of our panelists have actually contributed to it. 
which focuses on the issue of citizenship deprivation. And it is why tomorrow we will be launching our citizen, uh, our principles uh, on citizenship stripping uh, through a second webinar and, and there will be more information about that in a moment. And so uh, we invite all of you to, to join us along in this journey uh, over the next one and a half hours. We have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Our first speaker is going to be Tendai Yachiyume, uh, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on, con on Contemporary Forms of Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Uh, secondly, we have Jawad Fairuz, who will be joining us. Uh, he's a former member of parliament from Bahrain, who was arbitrarily stripped of his citizenship and has now set up Salam for Democracy and Human Rights. Thirdly, we are delighted to be able to uh, welcome Laura Bingham, uh, a longtime partner of the Institute, uh, who is the Senior Managing Legal Officer for Equality and Inclusion at Open Society Justice Initiative. And finally, another long-standing friend of ISI's, Joshua Castellino, who is on our Board of Directors and is also the Executive Director of the Minority Rights Group International. So each of these four speakers will, will in turn go through uh, their very insightful and no doubt thought-provoking comments. Uh, and while they are speaking, uh, I invite you to submit any questions that, that you would like to pose to the panelists. You can do so through utilizing the Q&A function, which you would find at the bottom, right in the center of your screens. Uh, I will be filtering the questions through and I will put them to the panelists at the end of the session. Uh, we should have about 20 minutes of Q&A before we wrap up. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to, to hand the floor over to Tendai, uh, who uh, we have interviewed, actually there's a wonderful interview of Tendai's in this first latest report. And Tendai, through her mandate as the Special Rapporteur, has taken a real interest in the issue of statelessness and the issue of deprivation of nationality and has uh, done an imm immense service to the field. Uh, to take the issue forward and to also mainstream it within other human rights bodies. Tendai, uh, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you so much, Amal. So in a very terrifying uh, development, I just got the first message I've received from my computer saying that my internet connection is unstable. I don't know if it's just because many people are joining, but um, if I need to, I will turn off my video. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, I'll wait for somebody to wave if you cannot. So it's it's really um, a pleasure to be joining all of you remotely, and I hope wherever you are that you're all staying safe under the um, current conditions. Um, I want to thank Amal and the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion, and actually all of their partners as well, for all of the hard work that they're doing, um, and especially for marking a year of action on on citizenship stripping rather than just having once-off events. I think the year-long uh, approach really speaks to how deeply entrenched the challenges we're facing are and the need for sustained advocacy. So what I thought I would do in my time is um, examine or talk about why it's necessary to analyze citizenship stripping with a racial discrimination um, lens. Why would we want to talk about citizenship stripping in the context of racism, populism, and xenophobia? And in my <clears throat> remarks, I'm going to highlight historical, political, and legal reasons for why we want to make this connection. And then in doing so, we'll also highlight some recent, recent examples from my own work as Special Rapporteur that have attempted to make this um, connection. As Amal uh, mentioned in his introduction, and as is covered in the World Statelessness Report, the ramifications of citizenship stripping and of statelessness, um, citizenship stripping, um, the ramifications of that can be truly catastrophic. For some people, when they're stripped of their citizenship, this puts them in the category of statelessness. And as we all know, um, even though human rights are supposed to be about your inherent dignity, for many people actually being able to realize those rights is contingent on nationality, on being part of a political community that will um, uh, realize those rights. And if you are stateless, that um, connection is cut off. But even when citizenship stripping um, doesn't result in statelessness, it still results in um, extreme human rights violations. Some people have described the effects of citizenship stripping as civil death um, and, can, and can really disconnect you from 
the places that you call home, the people that are your home as well. And so because of what's at stake with denationalization and citizen stripping, um, it's really urgent that measures that move in this direction be subject to the highest levels of human rights scrutiny generally. So even aside from the perspective of, of um, equality and non-discrimination principles, um, human rights uh, scrutiny should be on at its highest levels just because of the ramifications of what's entailed when you strip people of their nationality. In addition to thinking about what's at stake for the individuals who are stripped of their nationality, it's important to pay attention um, to the historical and political uses of denationalization. So what do we learn when we look at how denationalization or citizenship stripping um, has functioned in the past? And for the purposes of our conversation, I may talk about denationalization or citizenship stripping, but I'm, I'm kind of referring um, to the same thing. And so if you look at the function um, that citizenship stripping has uh, played historically, it becomes clear very quickly that there's an intimate connection to racial and xenophobic discrimination as well. So it's not that every time you have policies that strip people of nationality or citizenship that something discriminatory is going on, but rather it's the case that when states have invested in the machinery of citizenship stripping and of denationalization, it's often been connected to some other project that is attempting to engineer the political community in the way that excludes certain groups, often on a racial, religious, um, or an ethnic basis. And so just some examples um, that people may be familiar with during Second World War II, Germany, um, Nazi Germany routinely relied on deprivation of um, citizenship or nationality of Jews and even disloyal Germans as well as a way of dramatically undercutting the rights that those groups um, had access to. Um, Syria in 1962, using the justification of alien infiltrators and this language of alien infiltrators is language that remains very contemporary and I'm sure it will come up in some of the other presentations that we'll have, but Syria in 1962 um, use a sentence, to, a, a census um, outcome to strip approximately 1, 120,000 Kurds of their citizenship and to exclude them from benefits of their resource-rich uh, resource um, region. And many of these group, many of these individuals remain stateless um, today. You can think about apartheid South Africa, where the government there used citizenship deprivation with the aim of ensuring that not a single black person could hold um, South African citizenship. So one of the, the moves of the apartheid um, government was to declare black South Africans to not be South Africans at all, but to be citizens of these Bantu stands to which they were forcibly um, relocated. You can think of the example of the government of um, Myanmar, which in 1982 set up um, a three-tiered system of citizenship, um, according to which um, groups like the Rohingya, for example, were put in the most vulnerable um, categories. And that move is one that remains central to the persisting vulnerability of Rohingya in the, in the region. So these are just um, a few examples of historical practices. And I know that we have two speakers, at least two speakers, everyone will give examples, but I know that we will have some examples of citizenship stripping practices in the US that are ongoing right now and also in India that speak to projects, again, that are, are, are related to trying to exclude certain groups um, who, from who gets to, to belong. And so a historical analysis, I think, makes the case for why, if we are concerned about equality and non-discrimination, when there is a ramping up of citizenship stripping or denationalization measures, as has been the case in the post 9-11 um, context, we should really be paying attention for whether there is um, concerns about equality and non-discrimination. And now I want to turn a little bit to speak about um, the political context and the current political context and why it's important for this discussion as well. So writing in 1934, so this is many, many years ago, a legal scholar called uh, Lawrence Prayers described nationalization legislation as, and I'm quoting here, a penalty that is primarily dedicated, um, oh, that is primarily dictated by political motives designed to rid the state of citizens whose conduct is deemed to be inconsistent with their obligations of loyalty to the state or more accurately to, uh, to the government in power. Um, and basically what his statement highlights is the manner in which law, as I've mentioned already, can function as a political tool. And specifically citizenship stripping law can function as the tool that either as a matter of purpose 
or affect advances certain political interests and certain visions of the state. And so in this context, it's important to think about what the rise of nationalist populism in the last six or seven years means for um, concerns that we have around citizenship stripping and, and racial discrimination. In 2019, I published, um, I think it was 2018 actually, I published a report um, to the General Assembly that focused on nationalist populism. And it focused specifically on nationalist populism as a threat to racial equality. And I want to reflect a little bit on some of the discussion in that report and then connect it to the subject of our webinar. And so if you, if you think about what nationalist populism is, and there's different kinds of populism, not all populism is nationalist, but I'm thinking about this combination of nationalist populism. Um, and I want to focus on nationalist populism that has an ethno-nationalist um, valence to it. When you think about what nationalist populism is that has this ethno-nationalist valence, the project is about limiting who is under understood as the people, we the people of the nation. The project here is to limit we the people to a particular racial, ethnic, or religious group that is understood to be the only legitimate national group. And unfortunately, we are in an era where you have right-wing um, nationalist populists who have been willing to open champion ethno-nationalist conceptions of the people um, uh, using, and, and, and these groups and these actors use um, the multicultural nature of society as evidence of some kind of imminent threat that is going to undercut the survival of the nation. I could name names, I could name countries, but I'm sure you can all think of leaders and political parties that are operating um, in this vein. In a climate where you have an ethno-nationalist um, populist rhetoric in, in pervasive, what then happens is that racial and ethnic and religious minorities are relegated to the status of illegitimate interlopers. And these racial, ethnic, and religious minorities might be refugees, they might be asylum seekers, they might be uh, migrants, but they're also citizens, many of them. And many of the groups that are understood to, in an ethno-nationalist context to be outsiders are people who are presumed to be outsiders even if they formally hold the documentation um, that proves this. And what you have seen in different parts of the world, and I have a different report that documents this, um, is that the rise of um, ethno-nationalist populism has resulted in governments, including ones that understand themselves to be liberal democracies, it has seen them rolling out policies that advance ethno-nationalist visions of society, even when these policies don't explicitly name race, nationality, or religion in the way that they are being um, rolled out. And the context of citizenship stripping is one where this is playing itself out. And so we might think that an example like treatment of Rohingya in, in Asia really speaks in vivid ways to how racial discrimination and denationalization can come together. But I want us to, to really be thinking about um, the nexus between citizenship stripping and racial discrimination and xenophobia as actually being a spectrum, a spectrum ar along which practices such as ones that we'll hear about, like the US using um, practices that essentially are ethnic profiling to strip people of citizenship, including people who are coming from Latin America or people who have been in the US for many, many years. I want us to understand those kinds of practices as on a spectrum alongside with what we're seeing, see, we're seeing, for example, confronting the Rohingya. And this is not about equivalences of human rights violations. It's about understanding projects of racial and ethnic exclusion as structural and, and systemic and as having flashpoints that mean um, analysis at any one flashpoint has to account for that spectrum. So I filed an amicus brief, for example, in a Dutch court challenging a practice that the Netherlands adopted in 2017. And I realize I'm probably running short of time, so I'm going to try and, and, and wrap things up. In 2017, the Netherlands adopted a citizen, uh, citizenship stripping legislation. And the Netherlands is not al alone. There are many European and other countries that have been adopting citizenship stripping in the context of, of national security. And the law in the Netherlands allows citizenship stripping only from people who have 
uh, dual nationality. And, and the justification here is that people who have one nationality, if you strip them of their citizenship, they become stateless. And to avoid statelessness as one of the, the factors in the background, citizenship stripping only applies to dual um, nationals. In an amicus brief that I filed before the Dutch court, which is actually available on my website, and I flag this because it has a very useful and legal analysis for how international human rights law prohibits citizenship stripping when it is racially discriminatory. But I want to talk about the, the Dutch case because I think it highlights the ways in which you can have um, projects that uh, make groups vulnerable on an ethnic and a religious or a racial basis um, that aren't fully confronted as such. And so if you look at Dutch society, and this is true of other countries within um, Europe, the last available data points to the fact that um, roughly 49% of Dutch citizens with dual nationality hold a second citizenship from either Morocco or Turkey. So if you think about everybody who's eligible for citizenship stripping in the Netherlands, about half of that population are people who hold Dutch and Turkish um, nationality. And then for everybody else, they hold other nationalities. Many of them hold European nationalities. But for the purposes of citizenship stripping, holding a second nationality doesn't uh, a second European nationality doesn't count. So if you are a Dutch person who also holds um, French citizenship, you're going to be understood for the purposes of citizenship as essentially having one. Um, whereas if you are somebody who has uh, Dutch or I mean, Dutch and say Moroccan or Turkish um, nationality, you're understood as having two. And the concern here is that people who have non-Western nationalities are being treated differently from people who have Western nationalities in the context of citizenship stripping and through a law that has been adopted in the Netherlands in a context when um, backlash and discourse, um, especially targeting people from Morocco and people, people who have an ethnic background from Morocco, people who are Muslim, um, that rhetoric very strongly informed the adoption of the laws, even though that rhetoric isn't um, articulated in the actual face of the law. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, what you see in that country is a facially race neutral law that disproportionately targets certain ethnic groups for citizenship stripping in a way that can't be objectively justified. We know that terrorism and national security threats come from all ideological and ethnic perspectives. The problem of white supremacy, including in the Netherlands, is one that is resulting in um, national security threats. And what you're seeing is that citizenship stripping is being a tool that is reserved only for certain kinds of, of, of groups in the context of what is being uh, purportedly characterized as a national security threat. And so the argument isn't that states shouldn't get to protect their national security. Of course they should. The argument is that they should do so using measures that don't um, essentially subject some groups on the basis of their ethnic origin to, to an, an extreme measure, which is citizenship stripping. Um, and I know that some of the other people on our, on our panel are going to give other examples that speak specifically to this dynamic. So I want to conclude um, very briefly by saying that my comments have focused for the most part on thinking about the history and the politics, the history and the contemporary politics within which a particular set of legal measures is situated. And it's really important for us to have that context and also to understand that that context triggers a body of law that is supposed to prohibit and protect against forms of racial and ethnic and religious discrimination, including ones that we're seeing in this context. And so um, it's important to understand that international law prohibits arbitrary dep deprivation of nationality. It prohibits racially discriminatory um, prohibition or dis uh, stripping of nationality. And part of the challenge is making states aware and their populations aware of what these legal prohibitions actually entail. And here I want to highlight the work that ISI and its partners have been doing to really bring to the fore the existing laws and principles that we have that are vital in this space. So for those of you who um, are on the mailing list or may have seen, there is a webinar tomorrow that will focus specifically on the principles that ISI and its partners have been developing um, around citizenship stripping that really I think that conversation will help 
delve into exactly what the law says in this space, including um, from, from the perspective of racism and discrimination. So I'm going to um, stop now for the purposes of respecting everybody else's time, but um, look forward to, to Q&A when I can clarify any of the dimensions of what I described. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tendai, for a typically insightful and thought-provoking uh, intervention and right on time, so, so thank you for that as well. Uh, I particularly appreciated the fact that you, you really, you delved into the histories and technologies of citizenship deprivation as a tool to exclude minorities and then you looked at politicals kind of dimension of this. And also looking at this from the lens of nationalist populism, I think that's very important and it's, it's a growing trend in, in the world today that we cannot ignore as, as we will come back to, to in, definitely in Laura and Joshua's interventions as well. Thank you for also mentioning the, the principles and for your comment on dual nationals. Um, and the idea being that from an international law perspective, it's, it, we cannot privilege one international standard, uh, namely the, the, the principle to avoid statelessness over another standard, which is the principle to uh, prohibit discrimination. And so any efforts to address national security and to counter terrorism need to be respectful of both of these and indeed other standards, such as arbitrary deprivation of nationality. So thank you again for that uh, very uh, insightful intervention. I would like to now hand the floor to Jawad Fairuz, who is the, the president of uh, Salam for Democracy and Human Rights. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Jawad was a parliamentarian in Bahrain who was arbitrarily stripped of his citizenship. And his story is a fantastic, inspiring one of uh, uh, activism and extreme generosity on his part to really work with open arms with activists and actors around the world to, to help us collectively move forward on this issue. Jawad, it's my pleasure to hand the floor to you. Thank you very much and hi to everyone and to the audience who are following us uh, this um, grateful and fantastic events that uh, ISI uh, are organizing. And uh, from my side, I'm so happy to see that the trend uh, uh, of the revoking nationality and the focus on this issue is growing and it is increasing. Um, uh, since uh, the day I became uh, stateless, when the Bahraini government decided on 7th of November 2012 uh, with the first group of Bahraini citizens to suddenly revoke our nationality without any further notice and without giving any justification. Uh, since then, I found that uh, the case of revoking nationalities is, is taking more international uh, attention and I think uh, still a long way to go. And uh, definitely this event is going to be part of this effort that jointly we and other NGOs are trying to uh, uh, get in, 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 in contact with each other and, and focus on, on this case. But let me say, as a victim of uh, uh, this revoking of nationality, definitely I felt it. And I think it is totally true that it is a social death. And, uh, uh, and, and if you lose your nationality, for my opinion, you are losing all your rights. So uh, I define it as a rights of rights. Why? Because if you are no longer a citizen, then definitely all your political, your social, your economical rights will be abolished. And then no longer the state will consider you as any citizens that you can have these rights. And at the same time, when you don't have um, uh, this nationality, then you're going to be without any type of the ID. Imagine uh, even the materials or products in, in, in this world, there are certain barcode then the question comes to us, what is barcode of us? And is it really ethical? And is it really logical that a human being uh, be without a nationality? Why? Because without nationality, definitely there are gonna be so much restriction of it. So, uh, and, and, and let me mention here that it is more harmful than you uh, have a nationality and suddenly you're gonna lose it and you're gonna be without nationality and in comparison to those who already stateless, it is very harmful to be stateless. But if you are already having your some rights as a citizen, and suddenly you're going to lose it by day or night, 
without any justification, I think it is more harmful. And this is that I felt. Uh, imagine you're a legislator and you're representing the people and by sudden you're going to lose your nationality by an authority that you think that you have a little bit more power over them. Why? Because you are an elected uh, member and in Bahrain political system the, the, the executive body is not elected. Then you will ask yourself uh, uh, who given the power to the unelected body to revoke the nationality of the elected person who represented uh, people like my case for more than 10 years. Now, when we find out that uh, revoking nationality, it is not most the case which I've been involved in, especially in the Middle East and part of it in Bahrain and, and, and in UAE and some other regions. It is not because that the, the, the process of having nationality was fake or you lie to the authority to get the nationality. It is just part of the revenge. It is just of, 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 of of spreading the fear uh, among those who are demanding the change, demanding the democracy, or they are human rights defenders. If we come to the list of those who are the nationality is being revoked in Bahrain, either they are PhD holders, they are human rights defenders, they are MPs, they are councillors, and uh, 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 most of them they are well-known pe persons within the community who serve the community for a long time. And they are, they are uh, chairs of the uh, NGOs and so on. So it is clear indication that the revoking nationality is not used as a, a power to implementing the law, or as they call it, quote unquote, to fight a terrorist act or hard line, uh, liners. It has just been used to eliminate the power of those who are demanding the, the, the change even within the law. So uh, this is could be used. And, and now what is being done on this case the government in Bahrain, for example, they made amendment to the, uh, to the terrorist law than to give the authorities, and the judiciary authorities and to the executive body to revoke the nationality of those individuals who they claim that they are part of this quote unquote terrorist act. And when it comes to this uh, 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 terrorist uh, uh, or anti-terrorist act, uh, 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 legislation, we can find that there are so much vague definitions of what is being defined as a terrorist act. If you, for example, you have different opinions than a state, you could be called as a terrorist, or you are, as they claim it, they are you're disturbing the national unity, they maybe they call you as a terrorist, and so on. So this type of the de definitions, it is um, uh, um, definitely is being added and amended to the law to give broad and, and, and wider power to the executive body and to the authorities to revoke, uh, to revoke the nationality. Now, the sequence is it, it is very harsh and very, very uh, um, uh, difficult to the individual. Why? Because you're gonna lose all your rights you're gonna have. You don't have access to all your official documents. No longer you're gonna hold it. They will take it out from your passports, ID and so on then you're gonna lose your pension financially. You cannot have access to your bank account. It will be frozen. At the same time, all the services, housing, healthcare, and so on. All newborn babies, they're gonna be stateless right away. In the same time, um, um, you, and this has happened in the Bahrain, no longer have legitimacy to stay in the country. You will be deported by force. And this is what happens. After a while, those who are nationalities have been revoked, either they are still in the jail, or the government, if they found them they are free, they will let them that you have limited time and they will be expelled out of the country. So imagine that by sudden, and you are a part of the in, in genuine uh, citizens, that you're gonna be stateless right away. And, and this justification which is given, we think that the time comes that we have to hold it and we're advised. Once again, that the combination of our efforts, that the UN, uh, legislations, part of the conventions, and at the same time, certain regulations that we have to revise it. The, the, the more power to be given, some special reporters to be uh, uh, looking after and focusing on the stateless issue and revoking nationality. And our network definitely will lead to a change to, to this manner. At the end, let me uh, clarify that the citizenship is much more should be powerful than the authority of the government the legitimacy of the government is being given by the citizen and not vice versa of that case. So I think that we are in right track to uh, join our effort 
to try to do the best to try to make the rights of the citizen to have the nationality. And without that one, I don't think so. The stability gonna be there. Part of the stability that all the people, all the citizens, all individuals in this planet to have their identification and to have the nationality. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Javad, for your, for your intervention. It's always so inspiring to hear you speak. Uh, and to hear the example of you transform things from being a victim who was in exile and who uh, was stripped of his nationality in, literally while you were uh, while you were a, a, a away from your country, and to to transform that that weakness into a position of strength, uh, and to uh, set up one of the most inspiring organizations and use it for incredibly effective advocacy. I really appreciated your comment about citizenship being more powerful than the government. I think that's absolutely spot on. States and governments get their legitimacy from citizens. In fact, uh, in most countries in the world, uh, sovereign power is held with the citizens and not with the state. And therefore, the idea that a government may deny someone of their sovereign power by stripping them of their, their citizenship is extremely insidious. So thank you, Javad, for that, uh, that intervention. Before I move on to the next uh, uh, panelist, just a reminder to please use uh, the Q&A function if you would like to uh, uh, submit a question to one of the panelists. I noticed that one of the participants had raised their hand. Please don't do that. Just write your question directly uh, in the Q&A. Uh, and now I'd like to move on to our third uh, wonderful speaker. We are very really spoiled uh, for choice uh, today. Uh, Laura Bingham is the Senior Managing Legal Officer of Equality and Inclusion at OSGI. Uh, but more importantly, she's been a friend to the Institute since before the Institute was even set up. Uh, and we've journeyed uh, uh, very long, extensively with Laura, uh, working on these issues, plotting and planning. And it's, it's a real pleasure to be able to celebrate the launch of this report with Laura because she's been so instrumental to our work in so many ways. Uh, OSGI did some fantastic uh, work uh, last year on denaturalizations in the US, a situation which has since escalated. Uh, and I've asked Laura to frame her comments around this process, which she also writes about in the World Status Report, but also then to relate it to some of her other experiences, her rich experiences working on citizenship rights around the world. Laura, over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much, Amal, for that really kind introduction. Um, I, I also feel uh, privileged to be a friend to the Institute um, and uh, to be in the company of my co-panelists um, and, and this amazing audience. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and I hope that you're staying safe um, wherever you are. Um, and I look forward to your questions. So as Amal said, uh, I'll be talking in particular about some of our experiences researching the phenomenon of denaturalization in the United States, which is um, similar to what Tendai was describing in the Dutch context, um, the stripping of nationality from naturalized citizens um, who may or may not have dual nationality, but who acquired nationality as adults, um, not by birth. Um, in the United States. And um, I also will relate that to some of our experience working on um, access to documentation of nationality um, for Kenyans and residents in Kenya um, under a new uh, digital ID system that's been introduced there um, and how that impacts on some of the groups that we've been working with who um, were already marginalized and excluded through the existing laws and practices around registration of birth and um, access to proof of nationality. Um, and I think Tendai, uh, I thank you for your remarks because um, setting that uh, wider context of the politics around citizenship and um, how it connects up um, with modes of exclusion has been very much the approach I think that we've taken not only to the, the national level work that I'll go into a in a little bit more depth, but also um, the process through which we developed the principles uh, on citizenship stripping as a national security measure. Um, and I also have to thank ISI um, for being so um, 
so strategic, I think, in the way that these two complementary webinars are framed, um, because for, as you know, personal reflection on the process through which we developed the principles, we constantly had in mind the fact that really what we were talking about um, was not a narrow phenomenon that relates to a, a set of policies and laws on um, the deprivation of nationality in a national security context. Um, and so I think being able to situate the principles themselves, with, which articulate really important um, legal norms uh, under the umbrella of arbitrary deprivation of nationality and the protection of stateless people and uh, the duty to avoid statelessness, that, that, that there are other pretextual justifications at play and that um, the instrumentalization of citizenship towards nationalist um, uh, and exclusionary state projects is, has to be the grounding foundation through which people understand the, the principles that will be discussed in much more depth from a legal perspective in tomorrow's webinar. And so I do hope that um, as many people as possible can join for that discussion uh, and, and take these two as very complementary. Um, and the report that we did looking at denaturalization in, in um, the United States in particular took the uh, kind of historical context and, and interdisciplinary perspective that Tim Dye, uh introduced this discussion with. Um, we looked at measures that were implemented more than a century ago in order to exclude, for example, um, Chinese Americans from access to citizenship. Um, some of the first immigration laws and citizenship laws in the United States involved um, really engaging with white nationalism um, and ensuring that um, certain, certain populations, certain groups just did not have access to a sense of belonging to the franchise, um, to any legal security in the country. Um, and what the report tackles is the, a modern reappropriation of statutes that are about a, a little over a century old that were adopted um, at the turn of the last century in 1906-1907 um, that allow the U.S. government to um, strip citizenship from naturalized citizens on the basis of um, some form of fraud in the acquisition of naturalized citizenship. Um, those statutes are broadly articulated um, and have been very, very narrowly used um, and interpreted over the intervening decades. However, when the current administration um, took the helm of the US government, um, a new bureaucratic apparatus was instituted in order to um, open up basically, how broadly um, this denaturaliza denaturalization power could be applied, um, and building on investigations that had been um, embarked upon by the Obama administration, um, sought to utilize um, government databases, old, uh, the digitization of old um, immigration records uh, in bulk, and um, new technologies to cross-reference old records with naturalization records in order to develop a, a much wider body of potential cases where um, individuals who had naturalized could be accused of having committed some kind of act of fraud or material misrepresentation, misrepresentation somewhere in the history of their process of acquiring U.S. citizenship. Um, and so whereas in the 19 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and so forth, um, the only targets of these kinds of investigations were people who were suspected to be former uh, members of the Nazi party, war criminals, extremely serious and harmful individuals for whom statutes of limitations um, had run on any other form of accountability, were hiding out, seeking safe harbor under assumed names in the United States. Um, that's how these statutes were used um, for decades. And there was a special unit of our um, Department of Justice that was dedicated really to, to these very co uh, complex um, accountability investigations. Now that ha has been pushed aside and denaturalization is increasingly used as um, a general in immigration enforcement measure. Um, 
And what we found in our analysis was that um, it's being used disproportionately um, against some of the same populations that the Trump administration has um, called out, insulted, targeted for um, other forms of racially discriminatory targeting. Um, and this is through a, a, a mechanism um, by which they prioritize how to investigate and, and bring um, denaturalization cases, which is to focus on people with a country of origin um, that is on a special interest country list. So this is a link with um, national security um, measures in general. And many, so, so what we found in an analysis of all of the cases um, in 2017 and 2018 was that about 50% of them were brought against individuals um, with a country of origin listing or some link to a South Asian country, for example, um, or another country that is on this list. They're almost exclusively racial or um, religious minorities. Um, we, also, we also found a host of um, due process rights that are happening when the cases actually get to trial. Um, and we looked really actually at a range of practices, just as Tendai was pointing out, um, not only denaturalization, but also this, the revocation of U.S. passports that happens disproportionately along the southern border of the United States right now, but also affected um, the Yemeni American community um, and has been looked into even under the Obama administration, um, so predating the, the Trump um, white nationalist uh, apparatus. Um, as disproportionately affecting a minority group and also um, uh, not respecting of even the, the stance and pro process-based rights that should be applied. Um, so I want to link this very quickly in the last couple of minutes that I have to some of the work that we've been doing in Kenya. Um, and there I think that the important, maybe useful um, linkage is around the use of technology. Um, because I think we do and we have tended to focus on historical uh, or even contemporary examples and viewing citizenship stripping um, as a spectrum or a process. Um, but I think it's really important as the year of action rolls forward to also think about what are the future um, threats and sort of what are new technologies of government, um, what role do they play? In, in the range of practices that um, is, the, is the sort of the central problem that we're attempting to address. Um, so in Kenya, just quickly, that was my timer going off a wall, so I'll wrap up, but um, in Kenya, uh, there, uh, the, the government has moved to introduce a new digital identification system that will um, collect biometric information on all residents of Kenya, Kenyan nationals and um, foreign residents. Um, so their, their fingerprints, iris, facial um, image, um, contain all of that um, sensitive personal data in a single database um, and generate a unique ID number for each enrollee off of the, um, the data that's held. So that they, and that it's a similar justification. This is a means of rooting out um, fraudulent interlopers, um, uh, illegitimate, individuals um, who should not be um, within the Kenyan borders or um, have access to um, the rights that this and services that the state provides. Um, what we have found working with um, the Nubian community and other communities that are either stateless or at risk in Kenya as a result of um, racially and ethnically discriminatory politics um, in that country is that they weren't, they don't have documents in the analog regime and they weren't able to enroll in the new system because the government didn't fix any of the um, existing problems um, and the existing discriminatory practices that uh, have excluded people. And it also did not recognize um, the, the disproportionate impact that new, the, the introduction of new technology will have because of those pre-existing discriminatory practices. And so I think just, just as um, Tendai was explaining in the Dutch context, um, that the assumptions around citizenship stripping as a national security measure are that it is somehow could be applied neutrally or that there are protections that it shouldn't be seen through a race discrimination lens. Um, these same kinds of attitudes apply um, when it comes to new technologies of government, um, that it's neutral or good. 
and um, I think we can expect, we should look for and expect to see some of the same kinds of projects and practices um, impacting the same populations that um, we care about uh, and that the year of action is meant to hold up and support. Thanks. Thank you so much, Laura, and, and thank you to all three of my panelists so far for being both brilliant and disciplined. Uh, it's, it's made it a real pleasure to, to moderate this panel. Uh, I, I would encourage all of you to, to read Laura's uh, chapter in the World Status Report, but also to look at the OSGI report on Unmaking Americans. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic resource and it's a fascinating issue. Uh, uh, thank you, Laura, for touching on the fact that both citizenship deprivation for a national security measure can be kind of pursued by governments by using tools which are actually not meant for that purpose and are not fit for that purposes, uh, such as the fraud regime, but also that other proxy measures such as passport revocation can have the same uh, impact on individuals. So when we are working on this issue, particularly from a, a human rights perspective and a discrimination and inclusion lens, uh, we need to be thinking broadly, not in terms only of what the law says, but about the politics behind the law uh, and how it impacts. Thanks also for finally ending with the, the Kenya example and that question uh, both for the future, but also very much for the present in terms of the use of technology and the overlaying of technology on existing uh, discriminatory systems, which uh, therefore further exacerbates discrimination. Uh, I would like to now turn, uh, uh, open the floor to the, the final panelist, uh, Joshua Castellino. Uh, we are very privileged at the Institute to have Joshua as a member of our board, and Joshua is also the director of the Minority Rights Group International, uh, an expert on minority rights uh, uh, for, for many a year. Uh, Joshua is going to be speaking to us more specifically about what's happening in India right now, uh, which I, I would describe as a perfect storm of populism, racism, and xenophobia. Uh, and I've also asked Joshua because I noticed that there were a couple of questions that came through uh, in the Q&A, which were specific to the India, India context. I've asked Joshua to also attempt to try and address some of those questions in his, in his intervention, also in the interest of time. So Joshua, over to you. Thank you, Amal. Uh, dear panelists, dear participants, and of course, the wonderful folk at the Institute who are enabling us to have this conversation. It's a real pleasure to be here and talk about what I hope will be the first of many issues as we really tackle what is another power grab by states of rights away from individuals. I think the context that we are in, and I hope that you are all staying safe uh, in the face of, of COVID-19 is instructive. We are all being told we need to return home. We are all being told that we need to isolate ourselves. But actually, how you experience the virus and what you do, should you be infected, is actually quite determined by who you are. And I think this is shocking in the 21st century, where instead of understanding what inherent rights and dignity mean for all, we still rely on the accident of birth to determine what our fates would be. There are some factors in this virus that, are, that you can do nothing about. If you have underlying health conditions, if you're of a certain age, there's not much you can do about that. But similarly, there's not much you can do about your ethnicity, perhaps your gender, your religion, your beliefs, your cultures, but somehow in so-called normal times, those factors are key in determining what access you have to rights. My colleague Tendai, who spoke so, so articulately at the start, set out how structural discrimination is now insidious and has become ossified and is a key driver to the rights that you may access. So if you are sitting comfortably in your homes with a good internet connection, hearing us clearly and able to participate, that may just be an accident of your birth. You may be somewhere else, much more exposed to this virus. And actually, if you do, if you're unfortunate enough to be infected by it, health services might discriminate against you. They might bar you from entering. They might prevent you from getting access to information which may not be in your language. We have seen in our work at Minority Rights Group International over our five decades of operation that there are structures that are put in place that prevent people from accessing the rights 
that we as an international community and as citizens all around the world and as individuals all around the world promised ourselves we would give to everybody. What is it then that takes these rights away? The states have incredible powers. My colleague Jawad has, has experienced these as a legislator in Bahrain and then has, a, has experienced this from being outside the realm of Bahrain. States can do incredible things to do good. States can unite people. Actually, it's ironic in the context of post-colonial states such as Kenya, as uh, my colleague Laura pointed out just a while ago, and of course, India and Myanmar, which I want to focus my comments on. It's instructive that in post-colonial states, we are using the rhetoric of so-called foreign to determine who gets our nationality or not. Just pause for a second here and think about that irony. These are boundaries that were constructed by outsiders, by foreigners, by European powers, which divided our territories into states. Who decided who was Ugandan and Kenyan? Who decided who was Bangla and Indian? Who decided who was Myanmarese or Thai? These were external powers that drew boundaries to suit themselves. Then the post-colonial state came into being and it had a choice. It either accepted all the people within that region as its nationals and tried to seek an inclusive realm to create a real rights framework by which all could develop, or it could play mindless identity games. Most of those countries, certainly the three countries in, in focus, Kenya, India, and Myanmar, took the approach that they were essentially multicultural in nature and multi-religious in nature, and tried to construct a unified, if flawed, narrative that sought room for all the people within that region. Where does foreigner come in now? And certainly, how is it that states now can decide, and bear in mind states, I say states, but as my colleague Jawad pointed out, these are governments of a state. They are not the states themselves. They are temporary occupiers of power. How is it that these temporary occupiers of power get to decide who belongs and who calls what home? It's an instructive question, and it's an instructive question because we are seeing a phenomena globally where populism is creating governments. Governments are meant to answer, in my view, two questions today. There are two fundamental governance questions. The first governance question is what measures are you going to take in the short, medium, and long term to combat climate change? The second question is what are you going to do to create jobs and to ensure that your economies grow? It's not just about economic growth because economic growth can be achieved by a few billionaires moving capital flows in and out of countries. It has got to result in creating jobs. Now this is happening in the face of increased mechanization. And of course that means jobs are disappearing. So jobs, as jobs get scarce, you've got people coming into power, capturing the anxiety and angst felt by many about the loss of jobs and loss of livelihoods. And what do they do? They try and create divisive politics. They try and find convenient scapegoats. Believe me, getting the Rohingya out of Myanmar is not going to create another job. Getting the Rohingya out of Myanmar is not going to solve climate change. Constructing Indian identity based on Hindutva is not going to address any of those two questions. The burden really lies on simply on the states to understand what the imperatives are that they face and to come up with real solutions, not silly narratives that divide people. Walls will not solve the United States of America's lack of ability to create jobs. There are bigger governance questions here and we are being distracted by states who are using convenient divisive politics to first of all seize power when they have no right to be in power because they don't have answers to governance questions. And secondly, then to justify their power by finding convenient scapegoats. And this is the context of citizenship stripping that we face in a modern era. This year of action that the Institute has called for is crucial for anybody who believes in the veracity of human rights and for anybody who believes in the inherent dignity and worth of every individual. It's up to you to take this mantle on to hold your governments to account, to call out the discrimination that Tendai does so expertly in her mandate, but to ensure that the politics of division will not cast its ugly shadow 
and destroy the cohesion of our communities that we face. COVID-19 is giving us, as Amal started us off with, plenty of examples of people reaching out. But if we don't safeguard ourselves, not just against the virus, but against the division of hate that's being sowed in society, we are simply giving states a new tool and a new weapon to wreak, to keep their, to keep their grubby hands on power that they have achieved by misleading people and creating scapegoats. So I call on you and urge you to join the activities that the Institute is going to launch and to really make yourself aware about the extent to which this phenomena of citizenship stripping is actually stripping us of our dignity and worth. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Joshua, for a, a typically rousing and, and challenging uh, uh, intervention. And definitely the ball in many ways is in our court and it's, it's up to us to, to respond to what we see around us and to respond collectively and inclusively. Uh, thank you for drawing our attention to the, the distractions and the narratives and the, the convenient scapegoats. Uh, and it's important that we bear this in mind when, when we try and respond in a reasonable manner. Uh, well, the questions have been pouring in uh, and some very good ones. So what I would like to do is see if we can get through as many of them as possible uh, over the next 20 minutes or so. I've been looking at them and trying to group them uh, a little bit. Uh, and I'm going to start with four questions. Some of them are, uh, have some of the questions are, are directed at specific panelists, but the others are more general. Uh, so panelists, please pay attention carefully. Uh, so the first question is by uh, Malak Ben Slama. I apologize if I uh, pronounced your name wrong. Uh, and the question is, you mentioned the historical example of the 1962 census in Syria that deprived Kurds of their citizenship. In 2011, the regime of Bashar al-Assad decided to grant citizenship to the Kurds in a political attempt to ease protests and rebellions. Could you further comment on this decision and how statelessness, but also nationality, can reflect political motives and how authoritarian states instrumentalize statelessness and citizenship? So that's the first question from Malak and perhaps uh, uh, it speaks most directly to Tendai's intervention, but I would maybe also allow Jawad and the other panelists to also respond. Uh, the second question is by Drury Dyke, and I think this is to Tendai and to Jawad together. Uh, could you possibly comment on the sense of the connection between civic space and discrimination and deprivation of citizenship? For example, if Jews in Germany in the 1930s never had their citizenship removed, could it have changed anything? If Bahrain did not have that easy out, could it have had a better human rights outcome? And the Rohingya? Isn't it something that should be just made impossible to the extent possible? Would that not also provide space for a pushback against forms of discrimination? Uh, and the third question, which I'm going to take on this, uh, which I would open to all panelists, uh, is a very interesting and important question from Kennedy Kanyali. Could you please discuss how xenophobic and nationalist racism has been coupled with misogyny and sexism to justify the continued denial of the right of women to pass nationality to their spouses and to their children. This is something we're seeing taking place in French speaking countries in West Africa. Uh, let, let's stop with those three questions because I think they're quite meaty. Uh, and perhaps Tenda, you'd want to go first and then I'd ask the other panelists mm -hmm. to come in. Yeah, um, sure. So thank you to my co-panelists it's always um it's always really amazing to be learning things as you're on a panel as well and i feel like i've learned something from each of our panelists so thanks amal for bringing us all together and this is a, a really excellent range of questions as well so thanks to the to the different people who've asked questions so to malak's um question about the use of of you know, you highlight the use of actually granting nationality as a political um, strategy. I think that's really important. And again, this is why context and the nature of political projects matter in terms of how we engage in a legal analysis, a human rights legal analysis, rather than just looking at the facts of granting or removal, looking at the broader context tells us something about 
the human rights situation and what the law should be trying to do in that situation. I think the specific example you provide is just one of many where you see granting of nationality to groups that have previously been stripped and you're right to say that often that move is one that's supposed to curry political favor. But one thing that I would highlight is obvious is, is typically that, that grant of nationality can be a very insecure grant, right? And the basis of who is given it, who is given the nationality even in those moments and who is denied it is something that's very concerning. So in the context of my mandate, some of the work that I'm doing, which I have to be vague about because the report isn't out yet, speak to a, a context where there was citizenship stripping, there was then a granting of, of, of nationality to people within that ethnically specified population. But then within that population, it depended on which side of the political aisle you were on, right? So there again, there's a political project at play in determining even who among the group that was previously stripped gets it back. And so I think your comment speaks to the need again to keep in mind the, the political and historical context. And then uh, Drury, and I think I owe you an email, Drury, so I'm, I'm glad you're on this call, but I think your comment is also one that's really um, important and, and interesting to highlight, which is, you know, what, what kinds of worlds are closed off or made possible by actually having the, the existence of this um, technology? And I think it speaks to where we should be going in terms of how we reform the law. The conversation tomorrow, I think, will be focusing on restrictions on stripping of citizenship. And I think what your question prompts us to do is which direction do we want to see um, reform? So, the point I understand you to be making is that sometimes or often citizenship stripping is a way that countries or governments use to take people outside of the box of national of, of citizens into a box where they can do things that they couldn't previously do while people were understood as citizens, right? So in other words, rather than actually develop a civic space that is equal and inclusive, you take people and take them outside of that civic space so you can preserve a certain life for one people and one for others. And I think if you didn't have the citizenship stripping measure, then people who were experiencing discriminatory um, uh, interventions from the government would have a means of challenging them if they still had their citizenship. So I take your question to actually be in some ways a, a comment or a point that we have to highlight, which is that by permitting citizenship stripping measures, we diffuse movements, mobilizations, and even mechanisms through which people who are experiencing discrimination could vindicate that discrimination and in general promote a civic space that is more inclusive and, and tolerant. And so that's, I think, a, a, a factor that should raise the urgency for really narrowing the context in which citizenship stripping is using and maybe working to a universe where we say there are just almost no situations where that is a permissible um, move. And then I'll say one final thing about, uh, I think it's Kennedy's question on an intersectional analysis. In my nationalist populism report, and actually in all of the analysis, the human rights analysis that I've been doing with my mandate, I've been highlighting the need for exactly what you're describing, paying attention to how misogyny, sexism, patriarchy interacts with racism, with white supremacy, with different kinds of racial supremacies, to really structure the way that rights are accorded. And, and your example, which I think speaks to citizenship deprivation, which is related to stripping, right, in, in a very intimate way, where women um, are prohibited from passing on their nationality in certain countries. It's not just in West Africa. Um, there's a number of them. And, and you see the gender of women being used, actually, to further a racialized vision of the nation. I think this attention to intersecting structures and how they exclude is absolutely vital and speaks to the fact that if we care about remedying racial discrimination, we absolutely have to take gender into account um, as well. So I, I value your marking that as something we need to um, grapple with in the conversation as well. So Amal, if I'm correct, those are the three that were targeted at me and yeah. I'll be quiet to allow other people to also jump in. Yeah, thank you. If I can ask other panelists to be quite quick because I, uh, there are some really good questions that are coming. So I'd like to do two more rounds if, if you all can be quick. Uh, so. Anyone else would like to yeah, come for in? me, please? Yes, just, sir. Okay, I'm gonna make a general comment of the most of the questions that have been raised. Uh, unfortunately, there is a total misuse of power by the authorities, and um, and part of it that's it's been manipulated with the power in a way of even changing the demography 
of the population. So, uh, and, and unfortunately more to more, we are coming to the democracy and forcing the more democrat, um, democratic process to be implemented on these countries. They do this act, why? Because, you know, democracy is based on the vote and based on the citizenship rights. So the best way they do, they change the demography, they bring new voters, even they don't have a citizenship, to giving them the citizenship. And those who are indigenous um, citizens, they deprive them their citizenship to take them out of the uh, constituencies. And this is what's so clear, for example, in Bahrain. Uh, um, we can see that the, the citizens, their national has been deprived. At the same time, more new citizens is being given certain citizenships. We have a record that, for example, last uh, uh, three, four years, we, the revoking nationalities reached more almost 1,990. And the same time, within 10 years, more than 120,000 uh, given nationality. Why? Because the, the governments there, they want to get more supporters through any democratic process if it happens. So the nationalities give given to the certain new citizens, at the same time, the, 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 the ingenuous citizens, their nationalities have been deprived. So all this misuse of the power here. And I want to say another major, major point on this case, there should be a certain standard and measurement toward that how we evaluate certain countries and, and, and this planet. And part of it should be how they're dealing with the revoking nationality and its stateliness. Unfortunately, this is not being, being considered as a high standard of evaluation. We know that the death penalty is part of the very concerned issue. Even the torture is part of the concerned issue. But when it comes to the stateliness issue or revoking nationality, it is less being evaluated to consider that that country is the oppressed one or to, to, or, or dictatorship or, or not. So I think the issue of the revoking nationality should be given as highest trend or, or importance as a death penalty, not less than that. There is a very huge campaign internationally to stop death penalty, and this is right way. But at the same time, in the same level, in the same concept, should be related to the issue of the revocation of nationality and its Thank you. Thank you, Javad. Uh, Laura and, and Joshua, if, if I may, I'm, I'm going to move on to the next round of questions, actually, yes. and ask you all to respond to these, because there are some that have come specifically to the two of you as well. Uh, so first, there are two questions which I think group quite well together, and Laura, I'd like you to take them. Uh, the first question is from Tanya Herring. Uh, Laura, regarding the biometric system being set up in Kenya, isn't the same thing already taking place across the world, especially in the USA? where facial recognition and fingerprints correlate with the passport at the border. Currently, isn't it being used for national security measures, but doesn't it have the same type of probability to be misused? Uh, that's Tanya Herring's question. Uh, and the second question is from Suhail Omar, uh, also to you, Laura. Uh, citizenship deprivation and digitization of data, uh, would you consider this as a factor for breeding and enhancing superficial nationalism. Looking at the CAA and CAB, that's the Citizenship Amendment Act in India, and the Hudma number bill in Kenya. Uh, yeah, maybe Laura, if you could take those two questions and then I will come back to Joshua. Sure. Um, I Yeah, just a quick um, note on the last round of que questions. Uh, I did want to point, um, our participants to another resource um, that Open Society Justice Initiative has on its website um, that looks at the instrumentalization of citizenship in Crimea um, as a, a sort of a weapon of um, territorial uh, occupation. Um, so this goes to the question about um, acquisition and you know, the use of, citizen, of positive um, uh, sort of forcing people into citizenship um, as a political tool. Um, and I reckon we also look at it through um, a, a third less so racial discrimination lens um, in that report. Um, when it comes to um, these the questions um, from Tanya and Suhail, um, so I think, yes, absolutely, Tanya, um, the, there's no, <laughs> 
similar to COVID-19, I guess, in a way, um, technology, uh, technological developments in governance and border control, um, you know, there, there's no restriction um, on where they're used, where they're implemented, where they're sold, um, how they're developed. Um, and so this is very much a transnational phenomenon. Um, and I think the maybe a distinguishing factor um, that I would point to um, between the system that's being implemented in Kenya, so the, the, a national integrated identity management system, um, and some of the, um, the, the surveillance regimes that come together in other societies is that this is, uh, the Kenyan system is a sort of totalizing 360 degree view database that is um, sort of packaged, sold, um, designed uh, as that kind of a tool to reinvent um, how the entire government will function. So it's the introduction of a government-wide architecture where every single aspect of government service, um, private transacting, can be uh, recorded and linked back to a centralized database. Um, I, don't, I think that that is in many ways the same vision um, that many states all over the world have. It's just the manner of its introduction, I guess, um, can be distinguished. And that, that could have um, ramifications for the, the way that advocacy um, and public education breaks down the, the kinds of coalitions that might be created, um, the kind of research that needs to be done, sort of the whole power dynamic around the introduction of new technologies that in, in, could infringe on a whole range of individual rights, but also um, very quickly becomes intertwined in national identity, um, access to, to proof of citizenship, and how citizenship is defined. Um, and how that population data is then deployed to reinforce narratives uh, of citizenship and belonging, um, as we've been discussing. And, and I think that the, um, the comparison to India and the Citizenship Amendment Act, the NRC process in Assam and potentially nationwide is apt. Um, it's very important to watch what's happening in India. Um, India and, and Joshua, I'm sure, and others can speak to this as well, but India introduced uh, a, a similar system to the one that I briefly have described in Kenya called the Adhar system um, years ago. There may be a decade ahead of what I'm describing in Kenya. Um, and it's, um, it's procedures, processes, um, the whole mindset um, that Adhar has introduced in many aspects of life um, are intricately bound up um, in deprivation of nationality and reconstruction of citizenship um, around an ethno and religious populism um, in India. And that goes from the level of um, uh, misspelled entries in a database um, because people don't understand the, the you know, patronymics and the way that names changes name changes happen over the course of people's lives um, to the very um, intricate targeting that can be done um, looking at very sensitive personal data um, uh, and, and population data uh, and deploying that effectively for influence operations um, in national politics. Thanks, Laura. Uh, okay, I, I, I've taken an executive decision while you were, while you were speaking to to deny the panelists the chances to make your final concluding comments. Instead, I'm going to go through two more. There's one question which is specifically to Joshua, and then one round of questions which is for all four panelists. So please uh, interview your concluding comments when you speak next. Uh, and then there are a few logistical questions which I will take at the end. Uh, so first, a specific question to Joshua. There are two actually, uh, but they're quite related. Uh, the first is by Kush Alam. Uh, Mr. Castellino, could you please reflect on convenient scapegoats found by the temporary occupiers of power to divert attention from pressing issues and how the government attempts to couch this process of scapegoating in a seemingly neutral, or as some would call it, inclusive legislation, such as the Citizenship Amendment Act? What implications does the use of such legislation have particularly in reference 
to the example of Assam and the National Registry of Citizens. So that's your first question, Joshua. And your second one is uh, from Terry Ince. Uh, my question is whether or how the people of Palestine are being brought into this conversation, as well as indigenous persons worldwide who not be registered in ways that registration is recognized. Thank you. So Terry Ince on Palestine and indigenous people and Kush Aram on uh, India. Thank you for those questions, uh, Kush Alam and Terry Kins. Really appreciate it. Kush, if we can deal with your, your question first. I mean, it is really instructive that when you look at the founding documents of the Indian state, this question did arise. You know, with the arrival of a theocratic state of Pakistan, should India become Hindustan? This was, a, this was debated at length by the Constituent Assembly of India between 1946 and 1949. And actually, it's pragmatism and ideology that won the, won the day. And that pragmatism and ideology commenced from the fact that India, like many places around the world, have had a history of movement of people. And actually, in India's case, it wasn't even a movement of people. Some people converted to other religions because they chose to convert to other religions. To now, to try to determine in 1950, and that was 70 years ago, almost to the date of the Citizenship Amendment Act, 70 years ago, a decision was taken and a promise was made to all the different religious, ethnic, linguistic communities in India that there would be a unified citizenship. Now that unified citizenship was already interesting because it allowed for personal laws, but it was also an important aspect to highlight that the state would stay neutral and fair towards all of the different religions within it. So to try and unravel this in the context of a citizenship amendment bill, a, a bill first, and then of course an act in December is really political maneuvering by a, by a political party who have seized on a convenient narrative to seek power. And I think what is at stake in India is much bigger. It's much bigger about the kind of state India wishes to see itself as. Traditionally, Hinduism has been incredibly welcoming. I spent most of my life growing up in India and benefited from the warm embrace that Hinduism had for all minorities across the board, including me as a Christian minority from, from Goa living in Bombay. It was an inclusive ideology. It was an ideology that made room, that learned and taught. And we all fiercely and avowedly identified, and I still do, and I don't have any other nationality, identified as Indian. It's interesting that at a particular point in time in the history of a nation that goes back generations and centuries, it's interesting that one particular government at one particular time decides to take one specific action that tries to rewrite the history. And in India's case, this is, this is not even, that the threat of sowing division is not even an idle threat. If you look at colonial India, actually Myanmar, Burma was part of colonial India. That got divided out. During the constituent assembly, assembly debates, the sheer issue of religion and the way it was portrayed further divided India into Pakistan. And then of course, as you know, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So this idea of separatism is something that is being sowed by a government that ought to know better about the de devastation it can wreak. And the issue also is similar, I think, to the point that you're raising, Terry Kins, in that Palestinians and indigenous peoples have not been at table. And this is a decision being taken, like the case of, of India, by people who are not at the table. So power gets seized by particular types of individuals who then determine what the rules of the game would be. And I think that in the case of indigenous peoples and the classic example that we at MRG work with are in Brazil, in the Amazon, or even in, in, in smaller communities in Papua and other places, these are communities that don't have a right, so to speak, at the table. They're not invited to table. They don't participate in, these, in these, um, any conversation. And they are seen by the state largely as objects and not subjects. And that's instructive because actually colonialism did that. Colonialism uh, treated people outside Europe as objects and not subjects. They didn't need consent. You could just decide what to do. Just like you could decide what to do with an animal, what to do with a tree, what to do with a mountain. But if you start understanding that we are all subjects, then you need to understand the issue of consent. The lack of processes to allow indigenous peoples and other groups that are far from sites of power into a process that will determine the rules is the problem and is the manifestation of the citizenship stripping that we see. Thank you, Joshua. I'm going to field three more questions to the panelists. Uh, 
please don't try and answer all of them. Uh, take a minute each to answer which question kind of resonates with you most and also to, to give your concluding comments uh, so that we can wrap up on time. The first question is by an attendee who didn't leave their name. Uh, the question is, is the UNHCR the best mandate holder for the Statelessness Convention? Uh, the second question is by Paula Pelletier from the Dominican Republic. Uh, and her question is, what do we do? What would be your strategic uh, suggestions when racial discrimination is the cause of statelessness? In the Dominican Republic, in situ statelessness has been deprived uh, by practice by the state without people's knowledge, then massively through a constitutional court ruling in 2013. And the law adopted in 2014 has not resolved the situation. So Paula's question is more around what kind of strategies could you use in this type of difficult situation? And the final question that I want to field to you by Patricia Hines, along the lines of Paula's question actually is, what in the experience of panelists are the key tools and methods to address this? And what level should we be focusing our efforts at? So, let me start uh, with the last and end with the first this time. Uh, Joshua, I don't know if you want to take any of those questions since you just spoke. If you do, please. I'm, uh, I'm happy to, to address Patricia's question, I think. Yeah, please do. The other yeah. questions, perhaps my colleagues are a better uh, place to do. Patricia, key tools and methods. I mean, in a sense, you know, we at MRG now for 50 years of advocacy, uh, essentially we have started off thinking about giving voice to the voiceless. That was the original mandate. But actually, the problem is not that the voices don't have voice. It's that we are too busy speaking and not listening enough. So I think partly it's reworking and rewiring the system to hear the voices of people who are far from sites of power. And that doesn't mean small technocratic solutions that improve the law, which is what actually we in the human rights world have done quite well, 70 years almost of advocacy around better legal systems. But it's actually about getting into the public square and really asking people about those questions that are meaningful, about home, about what it means to be home, about what it means to belong. Those kinds of fundamental questions. We need to rewrite our histories. Our histories are told from incredibly patriarchal perspectives to start with, but are also told from the perspective of victors. And those victors have conveniently written certain communities out of those histories. We need to challenge that. So it's a multi-pronged approach that we need, starting perhaps with education, but holding to account as well holding people to account on grounds that unified we are the on, is the only way that we can combat any challenge, whether it's COVID-19 or any other. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, Laura, over to you. One minute. Um, so I think um, maybe taking Paula and Patricia's questions together um, and just building on what Joshua said, you know, I, I think a lot of this um, look, the justice initiative, the organization I work for, the, the principles that we'll discuss tomorrow are legal tools, but so much that we've discussed now um, and um, that really uh, is, the, is the foundation and the root cause of the problems and the issues, the human rights challenges that we're talking about has to do with wider narratives, history, um, you know, and taking into account the whole of society. Um, and so I think um, in terms of tools, you, uh, partnering with um, groups, individuals that have many different perspectives. And for the year of action, we've um, done a lot of work to reach out to different constituencies, um, not only civil society actors and, and not the, the, what has been the core of the field working on citizenship and statelessness, but really actually to use this whole year um, to build momentum and to build the sense of a, of a movement. Um, I think Joad's reference to um, the death penalty and, and anti-torture um, uh, efforts um, is really appropriate and important to keep in mind. Um, in terms of what, um, what needs to happen, the amount of sense of um, sensitization um, and wide outreach and campaigning um, that should really sustain um, what, what uh, we're, the, the effort to end citizenship stripping. Um, so it, it is a multi-tool approach, um, but also an approach that's global and, and has a lot of room um, in a wide movement. Um, I, just a quick point, I'm sorry, on UNHCR's um, 
mandate. I mean, I think UNHCR within that is, is an incredibly important player. It goes without saying. Um, it's important to have a protection mandate for people who are stateless, um, a place for stateless people to go um, to engage with states from a diplomatic um, um, perspective. And I, I know from working with individual stateless people in many different contexts that UNHCR plays a really important role. But I think for this discussion, it's, it's also equally important to stress um, the range of different actors um, that w that is needed to marshal um, sort of a pushback against the root causes of statelessness and citizen and the, the political practice of citizenship stripping that we're discussing here. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and Jabad, if you have any concluding comments, maybe in 45 seconds. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I think we have to believe that we can make the change. We have uh, the ability to make the change. In the same time that we should face, there is a big challenge that we have to face it and try to uh, make a major network internationally, individuals, victims, NGO, uh, um, uh, different mechanism, international mechanism, human rights mechanism, and so on. All of that should work together. And uh, uh, just we as a victims, for example, the authorities want to neglect us. They want to us to forget our identity. We should do the opposite, like we don't. We, we publish a, a website called Anna Bahraini, or I am Bahraini. They want me to forget that I am Bahraini. I'm doing the opposite. I'm trying to focus on that. So I think all this together, we should believe that at the end of this dark channel, there is a very, very good light that we can depend and walk and make the change. Thank you so much, Javad. Uh, Tendai, that's a tough fact to follow. Over to you. Tendai, you're on mute. Okay. Um, so I will be very, very quick and Sorry, Tendai, we've lost other people on the use okay. of. Um... Uh, Tendai, yes, we can. Yeah, let's give it another try. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Somebody had muted me and I muted myself. Okay. So, what I was saying is that I want to focus my comments what human rights advocates and what human rights scholars and educators can do. So the people who are using the human rights frame and then the people who are educating others about what the human rights frame is. In my experience, you know, citizenship, which is a powerful and important and central institution, it's a political institution, it's a legal one. It's also a place that states go, as we've been discussing, to engage in racially discriminatory projects. And the history of citizenship, its evolution in the world that we have now, paints a very clear kind of genealogy of different points in time when states have used citizenship as the way they decide on a racial or an ethnic or religious basis who belongs and who doesn't belong. So that's one thing. On the other side, I would say that human rights advocates have really neglected to think long and hard about what racial discrimination in the context of citizenship laws looks like and what our goals as human rights advocates need to be in that space from an equality and non-discrimination perspective. So in some ways, this is the wrong audience for it because I think people who are here for this um, webinar are really invested. But I sometimes find that the human rights discourse around citizenship stripping can focus on procedural aspects, for example, due process aspects, all of these are really, really, really vital. But at the same time, we should be building momentum to flesh out what the equality and non-discrimination norms are in this space, as the um, panelists tomorrow will do, as ISI has been doing. But I think it's up to us as human rights advocates and educators to really make citizenship institutions, border institutions, no longer a safe harbor for racial discrimination, because right now um, that's too much the case. So I'll end there. Thank you so much, Tendai. And, and in the spirit of both Tendai and Javad's interventions, just to say that ISI, we've also had a soft launch of this other resource, which is called Shape to Shapes, uh, which can also be downloaded from our website or purchased from the website. And this, this publication, uh, 
it basically is a tool through which we can understand and articulate citizenship deprivation, uh, but also activism and, and collective action to, to fight citizenship deprivation and discrimination. And it's, it's in the format of uh, uh, a graphic novel. And basically the, the concept is that uh, the, the book is set in a world of shapes uh, and some shapes have been stripped of their shapes. Uh, Dava, in, in, I'm going to take a, just a few minutes to wrap up now. I'm aware that we're over time, uh, for which I apologize. But there were a number of questions from uh, uh, other participants, Drury Dyke, Martin O'Brien, Chris Nash, just to name a few, uh, which are more about the year of action and steps that uh, others can take to join the year of action. And I was very grateful to see those questions. Uh, just to let you know that the year of action is initiated by ISI and OSJI, but we by no means claim ownership of the year of action. Uh, to us, the year of action will only be successful if it's claimed and owned by everyone who gets involved. And so all the resources that we created under the year of action are free for everyone's use. Uh, and indeed, even the, uh, the, 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 the logo that we created can be used by anyone and they can add their institutional logos to that as well. So the objective of the year of action is to basically strengthen a discourse and an awareness on, on citizenship stripping and to push for stronger state practice that's aligned with international obligations as set out in the, the principles on the deprivation of nationality. Uh, there's much more information on our website on, on what we will do and what you can do, uh, starting with endorsing the principles themselves to promoting activities, create, uh, organizing your own activities, whether they are webinars or, or organizations or advocacy efforts before your state, uh, using the resources that we developed uh, and, and creating a kind of a global network to really push this issue forward. Like I mentioned, there's more information online. Uh, and that leads me to what I think would be my final reflection. Going back to where we started with, with COVID-19, which is preoccupying all our minds. Uh, if I was to make a final reflection on COVID-19, it's that this, this event that, that you, you participated in, it was initially conceptualized as, a, as an event in London, an in-person event. But because of what happened, we've had to adapt, we've had to be creative. Uh, but the huge benefit of that is that we were able to then make this event accessible to people around the world. As I mentioned, over 200 people registered from many parts of the world. Uh, and that's really reassuring because it, it shows that just in a matter of three or four days when we advertised the webinar, uh, there were so many people interested in this issue. And I think we can take some solidarity from that, that there's a large but unseen network of people concerned by these issues and willing to come together. And we need to find each other and we need to work together. And the year of action does provide us with an umbrella through which we can do that. Tomorrow, as many of the panelists mentioned, we, we have another uh, webinar on citizenship stripping in the national security context. And this will be the, the launch pad for the principles on deprivation of nationality. That webinar is going to be uh, ably chaired by Laura Van Vast, who's uh, my fellow co-director at ISI. And we have another wonderful set of panelists. Uh, Tineka Strick, who's a member of the European Parliament. Christoph Paulusen, who's uh, a wonderful colleague from the ASSE Institute. Matthew Gibney of the Refugee Studies Centre at Oxford, who's written extensively on this issue. And Anthony Dawkin of the European Council of Foreign Relations. So please do uh, sign up for that webinar as well and join us. Both webinars uh, will also be recorded and available for posterity. Uh, let me end by thanking my wonderful panelists. You really made my job very easy uh, and you, you held our attention. It's, it's not easy to do in a webinar format, so thank you. Thank you to all the participants for engaging for your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. That's just because there were so many fantastic questions. And please feel free to get in touch with us by that really if your question wasn't answered. Uh, thank you to all our partners, Open Society Justice Initiative in particular. Uh, also Ashurst and, and uh, the ASSE Institute uh, and our various other partners, the Regional Status Networks uh, and other organizations working on this issue. And finally, it would be wrong of me to end this uh, webinar without uh, specially thanking the ISI team uh, because literally within a matter of three or four days, they turned things around and organized this webinar 
once you realize that we couldn't go ahead with the in-person meeting. So thank you for your flexibility and your creativity. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to work with you. Uh, thank you, everyone, um, and goodbye. And wash your hands. <laughs> Thanks, Amal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye.